Hello everyone, today we talk about Celtic warfare and more specifically of the British or Britonic, if you want, chariot, war chariot, uh, that we will illustrate fundamentally in its structure, right? We will make other videos explaining, even though today we will digress on it naturally, you know, British tactics of this time that are basically Celtic tactics altogether, like there isn't actually uh, any sensible difference in, in terms of, you know, how Celts fought independently from the, you know, the peoples that they, they, they border, etc. Naturally, were variations, but um, we're talking about something fundamentally homogeneous by Iron Age standards, right, you know, politically, socially, there wasn't much properly anything that would make a, a radical difference. Uh, even though uh, British warfare, as you know, was marked by uh, a sort of traditionalism in 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 other words actually was more primitive and not surprisingly in this sense actually it had the lowest military quality of, of the broader celtic world and um, this is not really a way to say oh, well, okay but you know there must be somebody <laughs> who this sense was less. and the reason being as always not specific technicality but essentially less political cohesion because of uh, of the nature of what had been the, the the Celtic invasions of the island in, in the several centuries before, how did this had sedimented, connected with other populations, um, relative lack of resources, the, the most developed areas were essentially the ones of, of the south, especially southeast. This is no right altogether, but uh, chariot warfare indeed uh, embodies. Uh, part of this uh, backwardness, meaning that uh, chariot warfare had, uh, by this point, been we're talking essentially about, uh, this is a series for the enemies of Rome, in, in, in theory, so we're talking about the first uh, centuries AD, right, and or maybe the late, the late first century BC, also given that uh, the most important source on uh, British warfare at the time is Caesar. And that you know, and then there are naturally other connections to be made, especially relatively to the, the structure of the chariots themselves, but also of other altars, considering their British warfare altogether. And um, at this point in history, chariot warfare, such fundamentally in Europe, uh, Mediterranean, survived just in fact in, in the far north, and specifically in British warfare, and in North Africa like the, among the Garamantes, etc. If you know, we will. I will start a series on Bronze Age warfare, as uh, many of my followers actually requested, so we will see better how uh, chariot warfare spread historically. Uh, the British Isles were some a peripheral area in this uh, phenomenon, uh, even compared to places like Scandinavia back in the day, as fundamentally they were basically some of the areas in Europe that got uh, the latest chariot warfare and that continued the longest uh, to use it. And, and in part it should be stressed also that uh, British warfare wasn't, you know, had going on, right? You know, we're talking about Iron Age, we're talking about a gradual evolution properly meant of Celtic warfare over time. This is particularly evident on, on the continent, especially in Gallic warfare that is the, the best documented, again, because of Caesar. Um, and uh, and the broader reason why in the whole world chariot warfare had declined and or had remained, especially as we'll see now in a while, in in, in some uh, part in Hellenistic warfare was, however, in very different nature, very different um, function than the one it had been during the Bronze Age and at the, the peak of you know chariot warfare uh, per se. And the reason why chariot warfare had declined was essentially the rise of more cohesive, more compact infantry since the times of the sea peoples that changed a big deal back in the day and that we can see as the standard in this essentially in fact um, early Roman times where the world at this point is okay Rome has fundamentally knocked out everybody else at this point uh, but the even before that, um, the uh, you know the deal was about heavy infantry on the field, cavalry in general. Aside from the steps, where that that had properly a broader functional purpose to those um, peoples, uh, was not the dominating arm. And in fact, even when uh, nomadic 
cavalry crashes against heavy infantry doesn't have the technical capacity fundamentally to, to overrun it in, in, uh, if not for you know some uh, tactical accidents that generally speaking do not alter the, 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 the trend as such and this would go on for until the high middle ages fundamentally as infantry was always the, the base in this regard so already the fact that naturally when you look at Cal Cal um, in this in this sense actually British society when you understand that even in there frankly infantry had undergone an important development but that still uh, the elite fought in what this could have been in fact a bronze age, a bronze age context in terms of bronze age warfare as we have stereotyped it that he is properly the elite uh, go then that you know the, the same age Iranian hadn't ended but fundamentally just some some hundred years before right um, is is one that sees society subordinated to this shifting to this nobility that fundamentally owned uh, the, the majority of the wealth and that fought in the first line one against another in this kind of quasi heroic uh, reality in fact in which British warfare was still deeply imbued of, uh, on the base of naturally of clinic affiliations etc and uh, representing even properly in the usage of chariots this, that was actually refined right in, in itself as we were saying before the British had developed further chariot warfare from their own perspective uh, and from their own you know on the base of their own warfare and the same Romans actually you know struggled meaning against them like any against any other people meaning that of course um, nobody that this proves just you know the, the, the deal that fundamentally technology in itself is not the, the, the thing but doctrine is all of course that um, if two peoples go at war it's because they have they both know they have some consistent possibility of winning right so a more or less updated kind of warfare has also to, to under is something wholly relative to the context right and of course uh, the the Roman conquest of Britain was embarrassingly easy right there wasn't any fundamentally any major um, resistance in strictly military terms right there would be a rebellion so later on and this is dependent naturally on broader political issues and, and those were crushed anyway so um, yes we don't see like for many other peoples um, and differently maybe from other Celtic areas such as the Danube or also the north of Spain etc that fundamentally uh, 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 or northern um, especially the the, the belgians etc it wasn't any significant um uh military system that could oppose at that point you know a, a, a permanent professional army like like the roman one and this is normal as well um the the that minor note on hellenistic warfare and the use of chariots and the also the the, the fader that that story is 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 however different meaning that chariots are different um the Mesopot mostly was the the Seleucids uh, that used chariots in in combat and the reason there is that there is a major Hellenistic civilization that is able to invest uh, assets in producing chariots of enormous size that at that point had a very few to do with this lighter types that survived at the outskirts of a civilized world that were reminiscent of the older of the older type the agile one the one that was used on mass for example not quite by, the, by these people concretely because still the majority of their their army was composed like even in the bronze age however of infantry etc but um, something much heavier, right? Something that w that were more, uh, you know, the previous ones were more agile. Were meant to go back and forth, you know, having this hit and run tactics before, you know, smashing in the soft and up enemy ranks. And that's fundamentally also what in Celtic warfare it was used like. Caesar describes that as this, especially the preliminary, uh, the preliminary phase there. It was not just about skirmishing at all, but it was actually about unloading, literally the warrior in the fray and picking him up again at the end of combat and the Hellenistic ones where these chariots were designed properly to smash into the enemy lines by the foe that, that is to say without any preparatory um, uh, phase properly literally to break through right to to smash the enemy lines and this freaking things costed a lot right they were enormous 
uh, they were pulled by you know four horses that had massive you know structure on them. They were bulky, heavy, right? Something that were properly designed to gain speed and to smash just you know with the sheer sheer power into the enemy line. And as you know, uh, there were means to. Uh, to, to stop this, I don't remember where we made. No, we we made a video actually on something. Uh, we made something about Seleucid warfare. So we have seen how, uh, it, it, you know, you can, for example, make the horses run in a moke through skirmishers. The chariots themselves are not particularly maneuverable. So in that sense, they were placed just in front of the enemy line, just going straight. It was not any any any, any other type of tactical s s refine. In, 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 the, in the tactic. In itself, those were some exceptions because uh, the, uh, the the Yadoki uh, had, you know, a, a, the, the typical, you know, technologistic bias that we took as a modern civilization from, uh, you know, uh, an otherwise dramatically advanced and, in fact, too much theoretically advanced at some point, uh, Atlantic civilization. Uh, but uh, that, in fact, you know, this tactic would, wouldn't be used uh, again, but nor by the Romans, nor by basically anybody else later on, right? Chariot warfare was at that time become anachronistic, right? The broader political and social capacity of the developed civilizations made it fundamentally uh, obsolete in, in front of the tactical effectiveness of, of the other arms as such right and in fact it should be noted that also in in celtic warfare not just this had factually happened because essentially in the continent i i think after the 30s of the third century bc that there is no other um evidence of of, of war chariots employed in battle which is which is remarkable if you think about it it in in British perspective, where the thing uh, remained. Naturally, there are some doubts about this, meaning I personally believe that um, chariot warfare, of course, remained around, especially in Northern Europe, I would say in Scandinavia, it would have not been so strange, actually, to see war chariots also for, for a long time to come. And if I'm not wrong, you know, aside from the burial um, uh, evidence, etc., because the chariot was the great symbol of um, of the sun uh, god to, together with the horse etc there was probably an aristocratic ethos attached to it we have documented it since it's in the bronze age the the the, the universal meaning of any people uh that we're talking about even in the range of this uh, video was fundamentally the hero arriving on the battlefield uh on on a chariot right and guided by this angel of, of war uh, and uh, the the celestial glory of the sky you know essentially passing through him through his virtue by delivering a massacre of its enemies and you know self-declaring uh, itself at that at that point because it was one thing with the, the heroic the, the semi-divine nature of the the imperium itself and you find it with the same identical symbolism everywhere every freaking where in greece in rome um uh, these were aristocratic society at the end of the day Let, let's be they were oligarchic right at, at at best right and so we completely misunderstood in a sense you know since the enlightenment properly the essence of, of these civilizations so were based only and exclusively on religion and warfare right just like the celts like any other people at the time right and and therefore the the symbol of a chariot you know there are some uh, uh, chariots buried in 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 the Roman Empire right in, in, still in this in this time especially in areas where also the Celts had had been you know places like like Bosnia or Serbia etc there are, there, are uh, there is substantial evidence of the fact that the chariot remained that uh, universal symbol of uh, military. Uh, divine power that had marked warrior cultures all over all over the continent since since ever fundamentally or at least you know since ever since in that case the chariot had come by but fundamentally as part of that broader shared universal values that every people uh, adhere to so uh, 
we find, for example, literary evidence of chariots, think about Coco Lane, uh, chariot in, in Irish poetry, but it's a recurrent thing. Whether, it doesn't even matter that it's mythological in nature, the important is that they still believed it was a thing, right? And again, if you look at the technological potential of the time, it's not much that chariots were outdated at this point because of some intrinsic reason. You can't st always use a chariot in some way in, in warfare uh, with some with some capacity. The point is how you know this is effective in relative terms and how you know in the broader political and social spectrum it makes sense whether to use it or not. That's the first thing that makes it outdated, frankly. So in, in a in a British society such as the pre-Roman one where the you had essentially this idea of hero slash champion um, slash chieftain slash warrior because also in there that you know there wasn't a big deal of certification that would make the, the things change rather much it was a dramatically unstable reality warfare was all over the place so um, there was a an unavoidable reliance still on this individuality more than in, even in other Celtic eras, not just in the rest of the world um, and a chariot fit, broadly speaking, such and such function, and we know that uh, it had um, been integrated successfully in some further development of of this military cultures that made uh, also a quantitative amount of the same. It's fair to say that that the chariot in British warfare was literally the the spearhead of the formation. It was uh, we we don't know too much about these people's um, cultures to properly realize how, you know, they would literally fight um, uh, in, in open field, but uh, it, it, it's rather clear that there wasn't, um, uh, you know, as we were saying before, much greater consistency um, in, in this specific uh, type of of combat, right? And eventually, you know, when Caesar arrived, they, they, the the Britons entrenched themselves into their their fort hills in their you know in the forest and all this. So they naturally uh, drew uh, they withdrew from open field confrontations, right? They would do it just when they had you know the size of at advantage. Uh, but for the rest, they would carry on mostly this attritional you know guerrilla style warfare because at that point, against again the, the Roman legions wasn't much that they could. Uh, concretely do uh, and uh, by by standard let's say by average standard so it's evidencing in this sense the fact that of course the, the major reliance was on chariot warfare that infantry naturally was conceived like in, in the rest of Celtic warfare state still made use of this of um, you know opening these gaps like a spearhead like of, of, as you understand there are certain functions that overlap as we were saying before it's the same thing that ideally an Hellenistic chariot would do it's just that these ones were much smaller more maneuverable in that sense and they were more also and therefore there was a kind of more fluid uh, employment on the field always leaving you know uh, always understanding that the chariot in this sense had uh, was less maneuverable than than cavalry as such, in that the Britons uh, actually did make a substantial use of, of cavalry warfare, properly meant, and this is a bit the thing that, you know, in Britain, also later on when the Anglo-Saxons, you know, but mounted warfare was not quite a thing. Actually, there are lots of, of hints that point at the fact that it was actually a thing, and also even probably more than and more than we think in, in general terms, um, and that we can effectively measure. Um, so the these chariots didn't have enough, you know, the, uh, maneuverability, mostly due to their radius range, to the fact that they were still, you know, not so uh, adaptive to terrain like uh, horse legs are, but that still were employed. This Caesar tells us actually on, on quite difficult terrain, and this makes us reflect properly also on what was, in fact, the structure of these chariots, right? And before that, this brings us to to another consideration that is as as often not just we overlook uh, uh, we overlook the importance of collective training for uh, 
you know, for an effective, for an effective military quality. That is, well, these peoples largely wouldn't have, but equally we underestimate the individual training. So the the way this these peoples were trying to make up for that broader disadvantage from the individual's point of view, right? That of course wouldn't reach by by definition the one of collective effectiveness, but still would provide an incredible um, flexibility, individually speaking. And we know, in fact, that uh, you know this broadly speaking, not just with, with with chariots, but also with horses, these warriors were able to perform astonishing stunts, like basically any other people at the time, like if you look at, you know, the Numidians were able to do the same, uh, other people, like everybody, like including the same Romans in, 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 a, in, in a less degree, but again, the, the world was much more homogeneous, in the, individually speaking, all right? The important, the, the major difference by scale was made how collectively organized these things were, and naturally, British political fragmentation wouldn't provide uh, the same. So, um, there are some pictures of Celtic chariots, uh, circ uh, you know, circulating, right? Uh, the, there are, let's say, the most famous type of published reconstructions show. I think it's the same one we can see in the pictures I've, I've inserted here. I could find, by the way, a very few Creative Commons or non-copyrighted ones. So that is, this means it's my thermometer to, to understand properly how, you know, interesting or popular these topics are. And unfortunately, I, I wish they were more. Um, uh, more, you know, documented, there was a greater interest uh, altogether. And we got this form, let's say, uh, f mostly from coins, chariot burials, of course, uh, the gravestone uh, from Padua in northern Italy, and bronze buckets fr from, I think, Serbia or Croatia, I don't remember now, but uh, also more stuff naturally has is coming out every once in a while, but I think we haven't sorted the problem factually what um, what these chariots concretely were like and this, this are one of those uh, things you, we have just to be humble enough to realize we, we will not concretely know right um, for for many reasons not just the fact that naturally there are very few sources in, in ancient history in but properly that things worked um, on the field in ways that we were not there to film Right, so naturally there are some hypotheses, certain attempts of reconstruction, of you know even of reenactment. But you know what I think about this these things in general, given the the sheer variability of of the factors involved. So um, I will not comment on further. Um, and some broader uh, criticism has pointed out, probably rightfully, that. The, the type of chariot box that is usually depicted would be too few to accommodate, especially um, a crew of two side by side, right? Um, that would have been the most functional in, also properly for the stability of the same crew, right? Because we will see also the the basing structure, the one the, 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 uh, the, the crew was standing, it wasn't anything particularly, uh, you know, the, the on, on, on tough terrain, you, you need some, you know, some distance, some protection, some connection um, to the to the edges of this thing, so that that for you at least to, to be safe. Um, naturally, on this chariot, it would be able to perform, as we were saying before, the, the greatest forms of stunt. So we shouldn't be surprised in general. But properly, to given the difficulties and the practical use of this chariot in the heat of battle, you these things might have were to be conceived in a, in a way that would offer the, 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 the greatest stability, naturally balanced with, with other factors such as maneuverability, um, the same, you know, in fact, uh, the same speed, first of all, uh, etc. And other, you know, uh, and, and cost, strictly speaking, also because these things were the nobility uh, toys, fundamental, and weren't just for everybody. Um, so, um, if we look at these reconstructions as if um, these th this crew should have been one behind the other, right? And this is a theory, but it's debatable. Um, let's say 
that some of the earlier reconstructions show also a twin arc frame, right? Um, albeit with another arc joining them. So this would have provided some kind of better rigidity at less weight, right? Being a more efficient structure altogether. And probably both methods were used, right? There, there was no standard uh, here as we see, in fact, that there are in the same sources uh, evidence uh, there is evidence for for both models um, so um, there naturally these representations might have also been somewhat with some some somewhat li uh, licentious for some reason we, we don't know the Padua chariot um, also shows the crew partially side by side right so proving that would have been a, a larger space a larger width um, that is no longer in this sense in relation to the wheels than the earlier reconstruction. Um, also, there is the possibility of some comparative approach, for example, with the earlier Bronze Age chariots. If you look at, for example, Tutankhamen's tomb, right? These, you know, have objectively small boxes. Um, some say, I don't know what the average given for a Celtic. Uh, chariot would have been so I found you know like one square meter which seems rather too few right um, and so that would be three feet and four inches um, uh, you know yes square um, and the um, uh, but we understand that it, it had that was also natural the smaller it was the you know the less weight as a thing. Well, in the case of the Egyptian uh, ones, we know that, for example, the, the crews f did fight side by side, right? So why not also in the Celtic say? Um, and fourthly, Caesar says that um, chariot warriors, uh, warriors, of course, often dismounted over the front of the chariot by running along the pole, right? And if the observation is that if the driver had been <laughs> in between, right, as the, the warrior would have s s stood, you know, in, in behind him, uh, well, there would have not been space to, to properly to carry this maneuver out, apparently. And given the estimated platform surface in general, you know, th this is a factual uh, problem. So there is yet another point that is immense weight completely behind the axle would have left the vehicle badly balanced right and given that Caesar says that the, the burdens drove uh, very fast across hillsides right uh, we can think that these these chariots had naturally to to, to be much more you know stably um, hosting their own crews than than the the idea of one guy in the front one in the rear uh, would would suggest and naturally we have to be consistent about this and uh, breaking our bias, meaning that whatever it was like, it worked and it went on for centuries. And therefore, you know, things that do not work really <laughs> do not go on for centuries, nor are, you know, affected in the first place. Instead, we know, in fact, they, they were. And um, uh, the, another point of variance is whether the traces hooked directly on the axle or on to uh, a swingle tree in the rear, so just in front of the, of, of the box, and at, as it, you know, it I, I I would agree with. So uh, hooking them on the axle would give a shorter overall length, right? So this aiding the turn, by the way, but it would have been less efficient and convenient, right? Uh, archaeology, however, presents us with uh, the the favor towards the axle, so. Um, there is debate on the artistic representation. Altogether, archaeological evidence suggests that the Celtic chariot was a sort of specialized version of the um, two and four wheeled vehicles used, especially in funerary rites in the early Iron Age. Right. Uh, naturally, a part of them, as we were saying before, were parade vehicles and they would gradually fall to, to that function in most cultures on their own. Right, so this was mostly to emphasize the high status of the warrior who rode in it, but we know that it was used in battle, 
as well, at least as a mean of transport, as a, uh, and, but also as a fighting platform, as a matter of fact. Uh, I'll bite mostly for, for skirmishing, but not only, as you understand it, especially as we will describe partly how these chariots were used. And um, so it's been suggested to that the harnessing of the ponies that were, you know, uh, were employed by the Celts uh, by a yoke, right, and, and breast straps would be somewhat inefficient compared with horse collars, right? That and, and, and it would have given, you know, a great handicap for performance and endurance. Well, um, this is not really uh, a point either because if you look at even modern armies, uh, the, the horse collars for, for example, artillery draught teams were abandoned for breast hardness and given that this could make uh, documentably run at uh, at gallop uh, three tons of weight <laughs> right um, of, of artillery well we can think that in the iron age yes uh, the 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 problem of using breast harnessing is, is not really a problem um, in considering the way it's involved and as we were saying before, these chariots were also very expensive. So probably their performance altogether, we can't think, was commensurate to the level of refinement that um, these pieces uh, really, really show, right? So um, practically the sides of the vehicle were, were double loops of bent wood, right? And from the pictures on coins, it seems likely that at least part of the sides were filled and decorated with wicker, or leather panels, right? And uh, the rear in the front of the chariot was open, so as to, as we were saying, for to dismount in the rear and or to walk on on the pole. And the uh, the floor was also possibly of leather, which in a sense can provide with, for that kind of suspension, like a flexible suspension, would m partly make up for the relatively small surface of the platform, as we've seen. Uh, and absorbing all the his terrain and of course if you look at you know ev every equestrian will tell you how you know tough your leg muscles have to be properly to go on horseback and even just you know in a in a civilian context imagine these guys would literally fought all the time they knew how to fight on horseback as well by the way and also that had this as we were saying for this dramatic um, physical fitness, right, which not necessarily means to be, you know, bodybuilders, but literally to have a, a, a level of psychophysical intelligence and coordination and exercise was, you know, incredible for our, or our own standards. So the idea also of following naturally the chariot's uh, movements and, you know, uh, the, the, the balance shifting, etc., was naturally not just a guy sitting there. It was somebody who naturally had to, to be very careful about his moves, but still exploiting, in the sense, the, the, the possibility of the human body in a way that was fun functionalized uh, ergonomically with the broader you know, employment of such, uh, of, of the broader performance of such chariots, uh, of chariot, wa in chariot warfare in general. And um, metal work uh, was often inlaid with enamel, glass and coral so you have to imagine you know the, the chair is here to be all colored fundamentally if you look at um, Coquelin for example we know that uh, his chariot was red and white so a two-tone thing but in this sense it wouldn't be less colored than a shield and or of you know the, the broader you know if you could we could see an ancient battlefield uh, like mostly with this, a bit of the same stereotype for medieval time. The f the one of the things that would strike us the most is how colorful it was. Also because these colors, the symbols, etc. were all properly uh, believed to be magic, to properly call on themselves God's powers. Uh, they had to be properly obstantated, etc. Uh, the same color of the horses, maybe. Like uh, in Coquelin uh, chariots, for example, uh, uh, one pony was black and another one was gray, right? This might also have had some symbolism uh, altogether, especially when you have these pairs, right? You know, think about um, Apollo's chariot and, you know, the idea that is intrinsic in these cultures, in the Indo-European cultures, where 
independently from a, a much or you know a greater or lesser use of of cavalry warfare still indo-europeans were all completely obsessed with horses in every culture the germans the romans the greeks the celts they, they were truly passionate about these and of course they were all connected to this idea of the of, of the horse as both as a, a as a ketonic and uranic animal so the ones that you know dr gets the strength from this bloody um underworld the one you know the divorce the same wars that you never have to fall into because it, you know but it from which the same the same animals emerge right as so connected as as they are with uh, with, with nature uh, with nature mother earth we could say but still these are the animals that can bring the warrior to the skies right to the godfather uh, di dispensing military glory uh, on the world and you know from which the, the you know all the merit of, of the mortals can be measured and, uh, and rewarded in which the to which the the the, the, the warrior will will ascend uh, at some point so the idea of the black and the white uh, are uh, connected respectively to these ideas and and of course there could have been a lot of playing like that and you have to fear properly a sin if, if, if think of a scenographic attitude Right. Think about the Karnaks. Think about all these uh, tools that were used to recreate a multisensorial uh, experience that we we can't properly understand of what warfare was conceived like as a sort of you know metaphysical experience almost. And the chariot naturally was a big like wow. Right. It's you know uh, one of the most praised things in proper. No. Also, there, there is in these cultures not really a difference between military and civilian life, but. You know, also at home, naturally, these guys would, uh, would, would during certain celebrations or, you know, uh, rites, we would use the chariot, would show the community, uh, etc. Right? There was, um, uh, I don't know, in the Celtic world, it was the use of, uh, but not only in it, uh, but following the path of the sun from east to west, right? Thus invoking uh, the, the overworldly power, right? Also, there were some other conventions, for example, Presenting the warrior shield side to the, to the enemy was uh, considered uh, to be a overtly hostile gesture. There was all uh, a broader, in fact, you know, code connected to how you would use these um, chariots. Was connected with a broader idea of magic, of training, of druidic uh, wisdom and knowledge. You know what what Celtic cultures were about, and the sense it was all one. Naturally, also with military performance. The druids were not like the things like you see in Asterix, like you know, the, the old guy that goes picking herbs. They they were, from, you know, in many cases some of the most radically violent and uh, you know uh, merciless uh, blood shedders in, in you know in, in in the Iron Age. So uh, there is naturally always in this society uh, a deep connection with this idea. We we can't properly even dis disconnect it to anything about them. Right, we don't we don't have that mindset anymore. We are secularized with modern. These these people live still borderline, and especially in in the British Isles compared to other Celts, in a sort of you know barely magic dimension. Here, the time of the gods is much closer to to the time of man from from their own perspective. They are still to emerge as you know develop you know com communities of some, some level. They may. there is a great difference within the same Britain. Right between the uh, the southeast that is you know broadly connected to the Celtic trademark to to, to the Roman Empire that they they even have uh, coins molds etc to to the north you know think about uh, the Midlands or you know even you know the 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 the, the, the center of Druidic cultures you know was was in, in the west on the Irish Sea and 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 further north or, or west like right? it could it could, it could really be. And um, but when we look properly at the quality of this chariot, like how it was built, for example, there's a surviving whale from Scotland found to be made of with three different woods, right? So even from the harnesses, we know that there were ext very rich decorations, right? Um, uh, such as uh, the ones with the terrace and the snaffle bit that make us understand that, w how, you know, in, yeah, in, in warfare, the re aesthetics is important, also for those psychological effects on the enemy that are cru crucial in combat, and must be overlooked. But it's always functional at the same time, right? There is nothing that is 
just purely aesthetic. Um, uh, there is always some kind of broader connection to what that influences the, the actual combat, right? And it was acknowledged at the time, because naturally that was magic as well. That was divinely connected as well. So even a crest is, in a way, it's it's connected. So the idea is that these chariots, that the point of, of course, could be of of different quality in construction, right? Uh, the richest tribes, chieftains, would have had something, you know, incredibly, you know, kind of something unattainable for some of the, the lesser ones, the ones from, you know, more distant from civilization, etc. But um, the, the idea is, however, that for all these uh, communities, a chariot would still be, a, you know, a, a, an important investment that, was not meant to be literally just destroyed on the field, right? There was always some, so for, for the stability of the same before, you know, you wouldn't risk it completely like just, it's like a sports car, right? You know, if somebody, you know, behaves like an idiot and crushes itself and, and even kills himself in the process. But generally speaking, you don't want your your Ferrari to to get, you know, even to get scratched. So given that this is something going in, in, uh, at war with, and this could be said, you know, for, for armor, for any, any kind of extremely expensive gear that uh, that will get damaged, right? Still, we imagine that its functionality was, was optimized so that any kind of structural perplexity that we can have in, in reconstruction for, for these people was probably not there, like in reality was, wasn't quite there, right? And it was all functional to the same, you know, survival of the, uh, not just of the crew, that of course was the most important thing, but properly of, of the thing in itself, right? And naturally there, there was some important manufacture connected to this, there was surely some business behind it, that's just, we are asking too much to know in detail from these times and places. And um, so the crew of, of such chariots, uh, independently from here, we talk about the British Isles in general. They could have been Britons, Picts, uh, Irish, doesn't matter. I mean, they were practically the same thing. Uh, and consisted functionally of what it's believed to, to have been an un unarmed driver. And a noble warrior. Mm. About their armament, uh, th there is some uh, speculation, meaning that the driver naturally didn't have to wield a weapon at the moment of the drive. It's, it's also a very physical thing, and you have to stay very focused and concentrated. But um, it's also realistic to pretend that this individual was unarmed and wouldn't participate properly as a fighter in the whole thing. Uh, he had, had to have a, a very good eye because Caesar explains us clearly that, you know, he was the one to leave the guy in, in, in the melee, in, 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 the, in the thick of the fray within enemy lines. So naturally the chariot has to smash through by a certain degree, but still it's a pretty precarious thing to be on. Like you pe can be knocked out, etc. Considering you are in this sense perhaps without a shield or maybe, you know, some is, you know, maybe it's tied to your arm, we don't know, but still that, yes, uh, le less agility implied, etc. But what about protection at the same time? And also this guy had to come back, right, to, to in fact, uh, pull out of, of the of the fight. So having left the, the noble, the hero, in, in literally surrounded by enemies or hopefully, you know, something, you know, a more convenient situation, but literally it's said, especially within cavalry, it was Caesar says that these men were were left to prove also the point, as we were saying before, that naturally cavalry in the ancient world was inferior to infantry um, uh, on average. And, and go back, so, and position itself um, in the nearby, so still somewhat exposed to the uh, to, to the enemy at least think about the range missile range etc because the, the, his objective was to you know to to take out uh, the uh, the noble warrior if things got seriously wrong and if you're if you know if you've left him literally amidst the enemies and the guy is uh, could could need to to get out of there at every single moment basically and also you have to be 
pretty watchful over the fact that you know somebody doesn't you know it's not stabbing in some ways etc you have to be close enough you can't be just like 100 meters away say okay yeah you know it of course not you, you wouldn't even able to shout at him but uh, this reminds so it had to be at a close range this reminds so much of medieval squires right it's obvious this was an heroic hands you know a quasi feudal reality uh, and these men were of trust in fact in the time there is an interesting reference to the special uh, the special um, status of the charioteer says he placed the charioteer sign on his brow a circle deep yellow shaped on an anvil's edge so here also some honors and trap because they had to be terribly skilled and also provided with some kind of a potropag protection that had to be earned by them in some way not just because they belong to the nobleman's entourage right so um uh, i it's um as far as i'm concerned like yeah i mean asking maybe think it there to, to be multiple warriors even more than two uh, or making other kind of speculations is maybe not so practical. I think that maybe a chariot that would ca could carry three warriors w was feasible. At, at least two warriors and a and a driver was feasible. We just no evidence of that, and that would have not been the standard, the average. But why not? This still doesn't solve the, the problem in itself. If not by saying that you know the larger the chariot, naturally the the more difficult to attack it, especially while it was in motion, it was right and uh, surely there were weapons at hand within the chair so surely at least the driver could could grab one in case of need and the warrior uh, had his own gear I don't think it's reasonable to think that the uh, the chieftain went there just armed with uh, I, mean, I mean primarily with javelins even though as Caesar says and you know it's kind of understandable that the broader function of, of chariot in warfare as we've seen also from previous times etc that yes there was there was a big deal of skirmishing that of course uh the uh you know the unload into the enemy uh ranks was something heroic hence not literally happening all the time in the sense you know i just leave you you know surrounded by enemies that's not quite wise right you know you can't fit the naturally the this uh, completely fanatic and exalted mentality of of a, of a of a of a Celtic champion that would be sung for for, for generations and generations in his boldness and and pride and and capacity. But you know, that just something also that you want tendentially to avoid. As you know, in, in engagements as that as we know, you know, in 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 Celtic Britain at this point, we're also pretty large, right? So the greater the encounter naturally uh, the greater the you know the rationale involved if anything just for the capacity of having been able to bring more tr troops there right still a primitive context collective training being you know low and you know mo most of these guys fighting on, on their clinic base of their clinic affiliation with you know in celtic warfare uh, order uh, of 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 the ra etc all, all depended on you know, if you had a good a good overall leader, if it was kind of broader political uh, cohesion and you know aptness to war, but it's not something you have to give for granted as a standard. Right? So mostly the, the, the you know tactics were, were simple, right? There was this main you know battle line, maybe, maybe uh, multiple ones, uh, but f most of the times it was about these chariots doing most of the things in front of the ranks. And hoping to break through and then infantry falling in uh, the gap and uh, they could get as m messy as you can imagine also because in fact bringing given that so much was depending on on the on the chariots themselves you understand that's not quite like using another formation yes as we just said this this char uh, you know chariots were probably quite Quite effective quite agile after all so they wouldn't be operated so differently in tactics like you know cavalry would right but still there's something different from it like you you need more space between them you need some broader in fact room for maneuvering in general and still it's you know they, they're also exhausting to use and and they have this additional function of of uh 
in, in theory, you know, uh, unloading the, uh, the the warrior and remaining in the nearby. So it's something complex. It's not just like, you know, hit or run tactics by skirmishers, then heavy cavalry arrives. And yes, there, there are so many, especially in this context, so, so many, so much in between in terms of kind of a medium cavalry that, do, that does both uh, on a regular basis as also the other cavalries do both, right? But it's just they're a bit more functionalized, specialized. That, you know, we know that these clashes were a mess normally. And so it, it's likely that the equipment was uh, most of the time at its finest, right? Maybe more javelins that could be stored in this sense, in, in some case, in some, you know, maybe even attached to the, to the chariot in itself, so that, of course, you didn't have to carry them. Uh, you would release that 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 um, the, that uh, fatigue on the horses, right? And you would just leave the you know these weapons within the, the the chariot box and not holding it yourself, right? That's the reason why warriors normally brought like two javelins, three maybe, or like two plus the spear, of course. But um, in the sense, I don't believe that was necessarily a greater pack of javelins that normally the noble warrior mounted on chariot would bring him himself at the point even of changing his own the rest of its armament accordingly right it's too it's too fluid it's too versatile it's too quickly changing as a context to to pretend that it's too war gameistic in nature this guy had interior to dismount and go fight like in any other situation so you can't imagine what it was like and naturally it goes without saying that in heroic warfare, the fact of uh, arriving on the battlefield properly, you know, over a chariot means that you have to make much less effort physically on yourself. This is the privilege that stands uh, naturally within the the hero that is literally transported by by his own will, right, and to to which the others obey as a, as a to to a divine force. Uh, on the field, and the the only thing he has to technically is the incredible individual individual performance of, of of killing you know as many enemies as possible uh, by being with, with this provocative idea to to be properly um, uh, left in the in the midst of of the fray as a consequence. So there is something extreme in it, right? Remember that uh, this this idea of being possessed by the, the deity of war. Uh, is valid for for the Celts, as you know. Think about the Dazacht uh, and this literally divine fury slash wisdom that you know this the, the Celts also would in, induce themselves in part as other peoples, which is true. That it was a, a common thing among the Celtic nobility with drugs um, uh, that you know would would increase their performance. But because technically, yes, to 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 get in a Celtic battle uh, in a Celtic battlefield meat grinder, you have to be literally uh like <laughs> almost out of yourself. And, and and it was a thing, right? And you have to consider that exactly he who would own a chariot to, to, to go fight like that was exactly the person that lived exclusively to kill people, right? The entire world, the entire what was dominated by, by these individuals that since children were, were trained to become the greatest warriors that the world has ever seen. So it was all functionalized to that. And it's quite, quite important to understand because, it, again, it's individuality that matters here. Uh, there would be to make a lot of other considerations on Celtic warfare because it's really fascinating. You know, mostly because of the things that we don't know. You know that sadly enough, you know the Celtic world uh, didn't leave us too too much. Like the Romans took it over relatively early, and we have mostly um, they were also in a limited stage of development, and they eventually would mostly get you know other less underdeveloped areas like Ireland, etc. You know the last isles of of Celticness that didn't produce this enormous amount of material either, but and also in times that naturally you know uh, are later than this. So, but there there are some hypotheses that I find very fascinating even about equipment of some forms of of armament that we will discuss uh, somewhere else. 
Uh, there is another question about Celtic chairs that that it's uh, whether they use um, sites on their wheel hubs or not. Now, archaeology mostly says no. However, there are two Roman authors uh, that assumed this um, in, and that you know had maybe some some reason for thinking it. Uh, one comes from Silius Italicus Punica, wh where it says to to devote stained native of tool driving his uh, seated chariot. So the native of tool would be this you know, this far north that uh, you know Britain fit ideally, right, as independently from what tool uh, would would actually be. As you know, there's the, an enormous debate on such things, but at the end of the day, also too few that we know. But yeah, I mean the idea that there would be a, a a far northern people who would use uh, seated chariots, and given that the, Br the Britons were you know kind of characteristically using it, may yeah may be a thing. The sighted uh, chariot is something that, as we were saying before, the Romans had already met, had already existed historically, and it fits to mostly to that kind of smashing thing that we were saying before. Uh, we will see in Hellenistic armies um, to properly add to the effect of breaking through and increasing the space properly of the gap it would open. Um, so in the case of Celtic warfare, like we don't have to be, in fact, so dogmatic saying, you know, just because archaeology doesn't show us that there wasn't, right? We mostly have to reflect on how it could have been formed, right? Um, and and Silus Italicus Punica is not maybe such a scientific a poem because it's kind of you know prolix and you know you know it has some characteristics but there is another source that is much more interesting that is Frontinus Stratagems um, 2 3 18 that says in the same way Gaius Caesar met the seated chariots of the Gauls with stakes driven in the ground so in here um, still it, the, is talking properly about the Gauls, and here meant a bit like the Celts. I mean, let's be honest, the Britons were, were Gauls, right? They were Belgians, essentially, and or however they were dramatically influenced by Gallic military culture. In fact, you know, the last areas of Gaul where chariots are documented, I think, are properly the Belgian ones, and uh, even though the Belgians had a dramatic uh, military quality compared to the Britons, because they were much more cohesive, um, they were also pressed by the Germans, etc. But, of course, yes, there were chariots uh, crossing the channel all the time, back and forth for whichever, you know, the political military needs uh, of these tribes. But what is fascinating is that Frontinus, as, as, um, as a source of such uh, use of seated chariots, had served in Britain, right? So, this is not a proof, of course, but it's still, you know, a guy that, you know, spent his military service in Britain uh, at a point where, yes, there were still, you know, when Rome conquered these peoples, of course, they, they retained a degree of autonomy, they served as auxiliaries, as militias, etc. So, uh, chariots wouldn't disappear the next day Rome subjugated uh, these populations at all. Also because, as we were saying before, it was a matter of political prestige. Like, the Romans coped naturally with lots of... They, I mean, think about Agricola's expedition in Scotland or the uh, the Irish refugees in Roman Britain at the same time. I mean, of course, uh, the Romans were perfectly acquainted with British chariots uh, all the time. Not just for having fought against them, but simply because chariot warfare remained there around them for, you know, to be documented. It's just that we should reflect at this point on the fact of, you know, why wouldn't the Romans uh, at this point say more about the sites? Well, consider that um, aside from the four horse sided chariots of Achaemenid origin that were occasionally produced in the field by Hellenistic armies, the only such battle, uh, let's say the closest battle actually to and last one at this point, in which um, this this chariots would be used um, against the Romans is one of Orchomenus in 86 BC, right? By Mithridates of Pontus, so a country that, as you know, had an important um, Achaemenid as well as 
Alexandrine uh, legacy, etc. So it was this kind of uh, there were probably some kind of symbolism attached to to the chariot, not just in those cultures at the origin, of course, like in any other, from the broader Bronze Age uh, legacy, but probably also to the idea of the chariot, really fielding a chariot still in a functional way was a big deal, as we've seen before, as a, probably as an asset, the fact that you could even spend money for things like elephants or chariots. Um, aside from their functionality, it still existed, of course, in spite of the general failure, such as at, uh, in this case, um, was a big deal. So um, the, the point of, of remembering this episode is, is saying that independently from our meager documentation, ancient history documentation, it would have not been strange for the Romans to, uh, let's say, mm, th uh, you know, see a, a seated chariot. Uh, the point is, however, as we connected it before, um, uh, I mean, also in Britain, but in this sense, there is a, a, a further passage to make. That is to say, this lighter chariots, also in the Bronze Age, didn't have sides, right? Uh, or at least, you know, they tended not. That, that is to say, the smaller the chariot is, the more agile, the more, the more you can perform with it in terms of properly of, of uh, you know, also interaction with other chariots. So the idea that, is that the distance is close and, and, and that uh, the, um, you see, this, this chariots went back and forth, as we've seen also in British warfare, the Hellenistic ones were just straight against the enemy. So there is a big difference on how you employ them. And sites are dangerous, needless to say, for for everybody involved, not just for the enemies. Of course, if you know that you're going to put, go straight against uh, an enemy formation, and not not just you have horses and uh, the chariot, all this mass launched at a, at a great speed what a, with an incredible smashing capacity, but it, Plus, if you, at the sides of the chariot you have sides, then naturally the longer they are in this sense and the, the more deadly they, 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 they can become in, in absolute terms. But also you have to be cautious because they could maybe hook somewhere or crash somewhere, you know, destabilize the same chariot. So they have a limited functionality. Well, the more you can hope to kill, right? And, and in fact, the, um, let's say, you don't have to care about the who is around you because you don't have to maneuver that much if you have to go back and forth especially in such messed up melees uh, the question is isn't it dangerous like for everybody these chariots wouldn't go in in the fray alone right there would always be around them somebody right uh, infantrymen uh, cavalry so having sight is risky right there might have been some chariots that were more maybe thought properly to smash in the sense it might have more likely have sides but in practice um maybe the the the, the risks could uh out uh you know could, could um could surpass the benefits outbalance the benefits and um therefore i i don't really believe it was the norm in british chariots but it can't be excluded either frankly and it's just it's not a an important point meaning that as we were saying before, it's, it's not having a site that makes these tactics more or less effective per se, right? It's way more important in a broader sense, the impact that that a, a chariot has on a, at a collective level in terms as this weight launch against you in the first place. At that point, you, you, you know, if you have a chariot running against you, you, you don't quite think of whether it has sites uh, or not. You rather think that the freaking, th you, your brain sees that thing as a, as a broader mass. Of course, the site can add to it, but frankly, it, you just don't want to be in between, you know, in, in the way of it. Uh, and um, you just flee, right? And or if you have enough guts, naturally, you stand your ground and you can hope to, to hold the charge in some way. Uh, in fact, we know that uh, this this is the same thing the Roman legionaries did. Uh, they and the same Celts fought like also. Well, given that the Celts in this regard, I mean the Britons in this case, um, fought mostly with you know among themselves. We can assume that it was such a general symmetry for which chariots went against other chariots, and therefore this also would add more to the idea that there wasn't really much need for sides themselves because 
there is no way to maneuver effectively or surgically to hope to 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 you know to cut a horse hoof or to uh, you know to, to to use this this blade in a in a functional way that for what you can calculate aside from all the other problems that you're facing in that kind of combat as we've seen these chariots were conceived mostly first of all to skirmish right and only when the enemy was soft enough enough to crush and through that so chariots versus chariot would in this sense um <laughs> out charity each other, you know, excuse me for the gameplay, meaning that, you know, if, if um, you know, you started taking hits, you were less, and the enemy over started overwhelming you with superiority, you would give way, right? Um, with the infantries, it, it, it's a bit different, because of course the same Celts would have met stout infantries to resist, like Celtic infantry was, was you know, as we've seen here, was, was average, wasn't anything special. Um, in, in general, they they especially in britain and but they they would hold their ground they would have some degree of collision this depends on on the on the infantry on on the tribe on the commander whichever the situation the morale all the things that can happen so they would be mostly lancers of course then would be these elite bodies of you know war bands of um, also armored guys we made a video uh, a, a video about this back in the day that ideally well yes they would use spear as as sword um actually it would have been more common than we think um but of course like um if you are if you know you're going to be charged by chariots you are going to the only way you have uh to to resist that is standing your ground with a with a spear wall and uh, taking lots of hits from these javelins that would naturally drive you crazy because it's you have to think of a shower, a continuous shower. That, aside from the the physical damage, really what bothers you the most is probably the psychological frustration of remaining there, taking hits, literally seeing people dying without doing anything about that, and being eroded and tense and you know uh, freaking out with adrenaline and blood pumping out, exhausting yourself, right? And that's what the the enemy counts on. And these charts go back and forth, and then the charts would 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 try to at, at last to charge into you but even in there what kind of british army would have had chariots on their own and yes there are situations on the line where this situation can produce but it's not really what normally forms the world warfare systematically uh, roman legionnaires faced this right and as you know they weren't normally armed with spears auxiliaries would be and they were technically the majority of of them uh, of, of the roman uh, of the troops of, of the roman army altogether so we know we made a video also on the on the battle of Mons Graupius that documents in part a uh, similar situation the battalion um, auxiliaries facing uh, Britain in, that was Caledonian's chariots um, but in general let's say a, a cohesive infantry uh, cannot quite be broken Right, and in fact, the same Romans were kind of surprised of such tactics because, objectively, they they had never quite seen it in in a probably in such intense and functionalized matter uh, manner. That is to say, you know, when they last faced the Celts operating with chariots, they, you know, probably saw s similar things. But that was in uh, in Italy, largely in the third century BC, and. Uh, we we think that the, the Britons made a, a, a much more su numerically substantial use of chariots in in a more functionalized way, and we're talking about 300 uh, years later than this. Um, so there there weren't other peoples around, as we've seen, that had this kind of tactics. So the Romans coped with such uh, chariots effectively, right? And there is in this regard, a uh, an obvious understanding that the the quality of their infantry was enough to to withstand this these charges. In fact, that 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 was a bit the problem with the same. I mean, the the Britons probably had to to realize at some point the um, not the inadequacy of their tactics, but naturally the fact that uh, you know not being used to such professional and co highly collectively trained troops, also with some broader, aside from the broader, you know, advancements in Roman, you know, military engineering and capacity of replicating it, you know, all these things, 
they they properly they in fact they would normally uh, try to, to to attack the romans just when they were in complicated situations just like when they landed when they were caught in the open um, by surprise but for the rest they would entrench themselves in their in their uh, hill forts uh, trenches forests etc and always with chariots however operating so that was normally by standard the their own tactics right the idea is how do these chariots operate collectively well they they put the enemy under pressure that's it if they and and, and they are functionalized in a way that they don't even need to to crash against the infantry in, by a certain degree right that happens only when the, the infantry is 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 soft enough enough it's it's kind, it's kind of coming apart celtic infantry was on average less resistant uh, than the Roman one, so it was easier in a way. So the Celts were more used to that kind of of standard, right, for using their chariots. Here they had, they could do that just by increasing the pressure, which means either increasing the numbers or increasing properly the, in fact, the the strategical, you know, the producing the, those strategical conditions in which they could put the, the Romans in a condition of inferiority. So mostly when they were scattered for foraging things like these etc so what were the chariot had in in in, in a at the more individual it got in one versus one let's say uh the greater effect it had compared to this the same proportion but in information so the the idea here is um uh the um, the, the greater um, um uh, problem of of putting of, of creating this condition rather than thinking ah did they have sides or not to cut it's not important at that point for for a Celtic army it would have been better to have more javelins right or having uh, let's say uh, more numbers in the first place as of, of chariots and of troops and that's political that's strategically it, it's not again technology is not the answer there um, and we fundamentally uh, can't go with this I, I wish i could have you know expanded more because uh, uh british warfare is fascinating and we will surely make other videos about it specifically probably about the british armies organizations and uh, tactics at the same time so these are all things we will see better also in certain battles uh sort of battle videos and, and a tactical analysis of, of, of sort where we can factually uh, highlight with the the most important uh, dynamics from from this point. This was just about the chariot, literally as an object, right? And I hope that something here and there emerged of interesting. But for now, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you, Herbie, for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.